Welcome to the Prophecy Club, where we study and research Bible prophecy. Our topic tonight is exposing the Illuminati from within. You see, my Bible tells me that we are supposed to expose the, the devices of the devil. We're supposed to fight evil at every corner. Well, how can we fight it when we don't understand it, we do, when we don't know about it? Because many times it is hidden. Uh, after all, the Satan, the, the devil, is the most subtle beast of the field. And our speaker tonight is uniquely qualified to speak on it because he was uh, spent many years in it. As a matter of fact, he was author of seven books. He was a satanic and voodoo high priest, ninth degree oriento templi orientis, ordo templi orientis, second degree church of Satan, new age guru, occultist, chandler. He taught astrology, tarot cards, astro projection, and he's a ninth degree Rosicrucian and a 90th degree Mason and a member of the Illuminati. Will you help me welcome Bill Schneblin. Well, I'd like to correct one thing. I'm a former member of the Illuminati. Amen? Because I received the light of Jesus Christ, and I'm excited about that. Um, folks, I am here tonight because I am a great believer in the fact that we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. And that's why I want to begin by sharing with you very briefly my testimony of how I came through a great deal of darkness into the light of Jesus Christ. Then we're going to try and get into our material. We have, we have a tremendous amount to talk about here tonight and to cover. And uh, I, just, I just ask for your patience and your prayers as we, we try to steam through this. Um, I started out wanting to serve God in the worst possible way. And for the first 30 years of my life, that's exactly what I did. I was raised in a very religious home, uh, but I didn't know Jesus Christ from a doorknob. I, I didn't know much about the Bible. I wanted to get into the ministry, which in my case was through the uh, Roman Catholic Church. That's what I was raised in. And I knew very little about the Bible, and I wanted to be a priest. When I got to college, however, I had my plans somewhat derailed by two forces that were very strong at that time. This was the time of the Vatican Council, Second Vatican Council, when a lot of ferment was taking place in the Catholic Church. A lot of my professors were telling me that the Bible wasn't really true, what little I knew about the Bible was false, that Moses didn't really part the Red Sea, that uh, Adam and Eve never really existed, that Jesus didn't really rise from the dead. What did that leave me? You know, Here I was going to be a priest, and I didn't know what to believe in. The other thing that happened, two convergent forces, is I had some professors that today would have been called New Agers. Back then, the word wasn't even heard of. And they played on a doctrine that's part of Catholic theology. And this doctrine is the idea that the priest is another Christ. And when you go up on the altar and you confect the sacrament of the Eucharist, as it's called, which means you turn the bread and wine literally into the body and blood of Jesus, you are acting literally as another Christ. And they told me, these, these particular professors, if I wanted to do that, if I wanted to be another Christ, I had to do the same things that Jesus did to attain that exalted state. See, they did not believe that Jesus was God Almighty. They believed he was a kind of ascended master and that he had learned how to do all of these things by going and studying under gurus in the Far East and studying under the Magi of Egypt. And some of you may have heard about this, either from bookstores or... TV shows, The Lost Years of Jesus. Now here I was, I was 18, 19 years old. I was being told this stuff by people who had PhDs, THDs, DDs, you know, all that stuff behind their name, you know, Roman collars on. What was I supposed to think? So I believed them. I began studying the occult because I thought this was a way that I would become more Christ-like. See the sinister logic behind this? Amen? And, and when you don't have, see, that's the problem. When you don't have an objective standard of truth to measure anything with, you can, it's like having a rubber ruler, amen? You can take a ruler, and if it stretches, you can make an inch this long, you know? And that's what these people were doing. That's why this is called the canon of Scripture. Canon in Greek means ruler or measuring stick. This is our measuring stick for truth, but I didn't understand that at that time. So what happened was, 
I fell into this. And by the time I got through most of my college years, I had realized that the most efficient way, the most powerful way to acquire occult knowledge was, in fact, to become a witch. Now, that might seem a pretty broad jump from being a candidate for the ministry to becoming a witch, but that's what I did. And, and so by the time I got out of high school, uh, college, I had written the King of the Witches, Alex Sanders, over in London, and he had directed me to a, a coven that was in Plymouth, Massachusetts. All this was taking place, I should explain, in Iowa, of all places. I mean, what a place to find witches, you know, right in the, the heartland. But let me tell you, you can find witches anywhere nowadays. And so by the time I got out of college, some of you already um, saw this, but this is what I ended up looking like. I was quite a freak. In fact, somebody on the tour this time said I looked like Jerry Garcia, which I don't know if that was a compliment or not. But as you can see, I had a lot more hair in those days. Um, anyway, I went out and I took a leave of absence from my seminary duties. And I, I went and taught high school for a couple of years and met my wife. Uh, she also had a profound interest in witchcraft and the occult, had been studying it for some time. And so we ended up getting together. And um, we found that there was a fellow who was the Grand Master Druid of all North America down in Arkansas. Uh, and he lived out in the country. Uh, you find that amusing, don't you? <laughs> We're going to be talking more about Arkansas before the evening is over, believe me. Anyway, he, um, he lived in a little tiny, well, actually he lived out in the country near a little tiny town called Hattieville, Arkansas. And from there he ran a huge network of druids all over the United States. And he saw some promise, quote unquote, in my wife and I, and offered us to come down and study directly under him to become high priest and high priestess of the Druids. So that's what we did. We went down and um, spent three months in the summertime studying under this man and learning all the mysteries of the five points of the pentagram, all the mysteries of hermetics and mental magic and natural medicine and all sorts of stuff. Um, while we're down there, one thing that bears reporting, because it bears directly on some things we're going to speak about later on this evening, is uh, that we'd sit on a, par on a park bench, or a picnic table rather, under the stars every night, and we would learn about these occult mysteries. And almost every night, over the, over the mountain that we were, we were living on, we'd see a UFO hovering that was quite plain, plain as day and uh, looked like a, like a long cigar-shaped thing with lights around it and was, was as clear to me, it looked about the size of a baseball held at arm's length. And we'd always ask him, what is that? And he would never tell us, because I already had had an abiding interest in UFOs which had started when I was uh, even a teenager. I was involved with NICAP, which is the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena, and it's now, I don't think it's functioning anymore, but at that time it was one of the two more reputable flying saucer groups in the country. So anyway, we got ordained as high priest and high priestess, and we were married for time and all eternity by a witch hand fasting in Zion State Park over in Zion, Illinois, which is just north of Chicago, uh, in a magic circle with 200 witches standing around us, a huge circle with all of them dressed in black and a big bonfire in the center. And uh, after that, we went out on our way to spread the gospel of witchcraft. However, a funny thing began to happen. We went from city to city. We, we finally found that the best place to be was in Milwaukee because there we had 90 students in advance lined up who wanted to learn witchcraft. This was in the mid-70s. And so what happened was we settled there and we began to set up regular classes and covens. Before we knew it, though, new things began to come on the horizon. Um, both some of my friends who were witches, in fact the guy who owned the occult bookstore in town, and also some of my spirit guides, because I was also a trance medium or what today you would call a channeler. I'd been ordained as a spiritualist minister and trained in that. Um, began to tell us that if we really wanted to understand the deep parts of witchcraft, we need to get involved in Satanism. We need to read the Satanic Bible. And so I bought a copy and looked that over and it was very, very interesting. I found I agreed with much of it, which would have astonished me just a few years earlier when I'd begun my occult studies. And see, this is how Satan does things. He gradually introduces you to ever more and more bizarre doctrines until all of a sudden you're overwhelmed. Well, I joined the Church of Satan, and soon after that, 
I, uh, I ended up getting the second degree in the Church of Satan, which is called Warlock. This is the certificate, <coughs> excuse me, that you will see. This is also in a couple of my books. It's reproduced. You'll notice down at the bottom here, I even got Anton LaVey's autograph. Isn't that wonderful? Uh, anyway, I want to just point out a couple of things here. Notice that it says, the Church of Satan having, you know, passed before the Council of Nine, order the trapezoid. Now, remember that. That's going to be significant later. Uh, also, I should explain that I had legally changed my name because Christopher Pendragon's sin was much more numerologically powerful than William Snevlin. Plus, it sounded a lot more dramatic, don't you think? I was, I was a Reverend Dr. Sin. Doesn't that, that sound like a character on a TV show or a soap opera or something? Anyway, um, so that was what was happening. Uh, so we began to work in, in Satanism, and I learned that, that, that Anton LaVey, and this may astonish some of you, but Anton LaVey's brand of Satanism is like kid stuff. It's entry-level Satanism, so to speak, because it's used primarily to draw people into the darker stuff. And it's very evil, don't get me wrong. I mean, it's not like it's a Sunday school picnic or anything, but compared to the real serious Satanism, it's, it's totally, totally harmless, relatively speaking. In order to get into that, though, there was something very important I had to do. I had to become a Freemason because you can't get involved in Satanism on the hardcore level without first being a Freemason. And so I found someone, I was sponsored into the Masons, and I became a first, second, third degree Mason. Uh, I went through the York Rite, I went through the Shrine. In fact, this is my, uh, my little Shrine portrait here. As you can see by this time, I'd kind of shed some of my hippie appearance. Uh, I just shudder every time I see that thing. Um, but this is just kind of by way of documentation that I, I really was involved in these things. That was my official shrine portrait, which they took as part of my initiation. Uh, then soon after that, I, I went through the Scottish Rite as well. So I basically covered all the branches of masonry that there are to do. Uh, and then I went even beyond that. But uh, this is my certificate as a, as a uh, sublime prince of the royal secret. That's the title, 32nd degree Mason. See, Masons love big sounding titles. I mean, they just think that's the greatest thing. You know, you, they have titles like perfect master, most perfect master, perfect excellent master. You know, I mean, you know, like these people have a self-esteem problem, right? Anyway, there's a couple things I just want you to notice about this, and I'll come back to it later. You'll notice the all-seeing eye up there, and you'll notice the motto, Ordo Ab Cal. And we'll talk more about those later. Uh, so once I went through all of that, I was worthy. I was ready to become involved in hardcore Satanism. What did that mean? Well, that meant I had to sell my soul to the devil. I didn't know that the devil already had it. Amen. This is a little ceremony that the devil likes to do, and I had to sign my name on the contract in blood. I had to sign my name in the black book. The deal was that I got seven years in which the devil would give me anything I wanted. He'd given me wine, women, song, dope, power, you name it. I'd have it. Then at the end of those seven years, he got to kill me and take me to hell. What a deal. Anybody want to sign up? Yeah, you see, you've got to understand something. The satanic doctrine here is that hell is not what we believe it is or what the Bible teaches it is. The satanic doctrine is that hell is this incredible party. It's like a nonstop, all eternity orgy. So you're, you're smoking dope, you're fornicating your brains out, you're listening to rock and roll through all eternity. And it's party hardy time. Whereas we were told that he heaven was a place where losers, that it couldn't stand the dark, violent ecstasies of hell, would just sit up there and strum on a dang harp for all eternity and just be bored silly. So bad scene. We thought hell was better. So this was how deceived I became. I went out and I got more and more involved in these various things. Uh, I signed up more people to get to sell their souls to the devil. I'm ashamed to say that now. But uh, continually this was happening. And um, <coughs> excuse me, I had to s get seven people to sell their souls to the devil. The other thing I had to do, and this might astonish some of you, is I had to become a Catholic priest. I had to go back to my original vocation. Because you cannot be a satanic priest unless, first of all, you're a Catholic priest. And if that surprises you, I just suggest that you go and you read some of the medieval literature. 
You'll see that that is in fact the case. Okay, so fortunately, <coughs> or maybe unfortunately, I had discovered a bishop of the old Catholic Church in the city of Milwaukee who was more than willing to ordain me as a priest in exchange for me making him a witch priest. It was sort of a quid pro quo thing, kind of like what's going on at the White House these days. Except I never got to sleep in a Lincoln bedroom. But anyhow, what happened was, is uh, I got consecrated a Catholic priest and then later on I got involved with a, the, the patriarch of the Gnostic Catholic Church down in Chicago. And this is my certificate being ordained, uh, pardon me, consecrated as a bishop in the, old, in the Gnostic Catholic Church. And uh, you'll notice a couple of other things that might be important here. One is that you'll notice that this is the ancient and primitive rite of Memphis and Misrium. Now this is in French and I apologize for that. Uh, the certificate is in my book, uh, Lucifer Dethroned, if you want to see it and, and try and translate it. Now the rite of Memphis and Misrium is the rite of masonry that a lot of masons aren't aware even exists. And this rite has 97 degrees. And I was raised to the 90th degree within that. If you'll notice down here, it says I was given the title of Grand Master of the Order of the Temple. That's 90th degree. And at the same time, I was made the Auxiliary Bishop of Milwaukee of the Gnostic Catholic Church. So I was just all set, man. I was loaded for bear. I mean, I had all these powerful initiations, and I understood all these powerful experiences. And this basically took me over what is called the abyss. Now, that's an occult term, and I don't have time to explain entirely what it means, except once you get over the abyss in occult progress, in ceremonial magic, you transcend good and evil. You become beyond such mundane considerations as good and evil. You're beyond morality. And you become essentially a god living on the earth, walking. And, and you basically look at human beings as if they were cattle. And so at this point, I made a choice. I was asked to make a choice. Because to move through what is called eighth degree within this particular system, I had to choose to either study lycanthropy or else vampirism. Now, lycanthropy is a, a fancy word for werewolves, it's learning how to be a werewolf. Now, I knew a couple of werewolves, and I learned from them that, in fact, it's rather a painful process. And I'm not really into pain, you know, so I decided I'd rather inflict pain than receive it. So <laughs> instead, I went the route of vampirism. So I was, I was taken down and introduced to a, uh, in a church down in Chicago, which was wholly given over to this vampiric cult. And I, I, I was made to drink the blood of what I now believe to be a fallen angel. And, and he, in turn, drank my blood. And by doing that, something happened to my blood. And I was actually physiologically transformed in many subtle ways. My blood type changed. I became impossible for me to eat. I couldn't eat anything. I couldn't drink anything except blood. The only solid food I consumed was the Catholic communion host. And I lived like this for over a year. I couldn't go out in the daylight without getting blisters on my hands. I, I, I had to get a third shift job working as a, a, new, excuse me, a newspaper carrier for the Milwaukee Sentinel. Um, I also couldn't get very near garlic. Uh, now, on the other hand, I didn't have the power to turn into a bat or anything like that. I think that's something that maybe Bram Stoker made up. I, I couldn't turn into mist and slide under doors either. Um, so Hollywood kind of embellished some of this. But the point is, I was drinking blood, and I was addicted to blood. Understand this, I, by, by day, so to speak, nowadays, my normal job is I'm a therapist. And I work with addicts 40 hours a week, people that are addicted to drugs, alcohol, and currently gambling. And I, I myself used to be a cocaine addict before Jesus Christ set me free. So. Understand something. Addiction is powerful, and the essence of addiction is that the more you get of something, the more you want. And, and so I kept needing more and more blood. Now, originally, the way I got around this is um, I, would, I had many witches under me. In fact, by this time, we had more than 175 women that I had personally initiated into witchcraft. That doesn't count the men that my wife had brought into the craft, which were probably just about the equal number. 
And of those women, some of the ones that had reached very high levels in the craft were more than willing to have me bite them in the neck. So I had kind of a harem, if you will, of five or six women that wouldn't mind me tapping their jugular vein every two or three days so I could keep my, my thirst slaked, so to speak. And uh, this went okay for a while, but gradually it wasn't enough. I kept needing more and more and more blood. And it just went on and on. And I, I began to live a life that was like the tortures of the damned. I'd drive through the streets at night in my job and, um, you know, putting newspapers in boxes in the wee hours of the morning. And I'd see the occasional prostitute or whatever, and it would be all that I could do to not leap on that woman and rip her throat out and just drink every drop of blood out of her, out of her body. It was, it was not easy. And the only thing that kept me from doing that was the fact that I really loved my wife, and I knew that if I did something like that, it would shatter our lives if I was caught. It would shatter our marriage, and, and everything would be, would be lost. So at this dark time, I really didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't want to start murdering people, but I knew I was that far away from doing it. Now, at this time in my life, God began to intervene, which was good because I wouldn't know where I would have ended up otherwise. Uh, what happened was is that I, every year I sent a check to the Church of Satan, my tithe to hell, so to speak. And when I got a check back from the bank during this period of my life, some lady at the bank had written on the check, I'll be praying for you in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Anyway, what happened was, I just laughed because at this time I was so screwed up, I thought Jesus was a vampire. And I just tossed the check in the file and forgot about it. But you know what happened? Within literally a day or two, my whole life fell apart around me. Within a day or two, I lost all my magical power. I lost all my vampiric power. I lost my job. I got sick as a dog. My wife even got sick. My whole life just it was like I was falling down face into the gutter and I didn't know what was going on I never connected it to because my ego was so great I mean understand something here I was probably one of the most powerful warlocks on the west coast of Lake Michigan and yet one praying Christian lady took me off at the kneecaps that is the power of prayer amen and and I want to encourage you people because if you're praying for someone and I don't think there's too many people around that are as bound up in evil as I was I mean they're out there but there aren't that many of them and if you're praying for someone be encouraged because that is the power of prayer and especially if you understand how to pray and bind the deceitful spirits that Satan has around that person and to loose the spirits of truth into that person's heart um, there's not much hope that, that person isn't going to get right with the Lord sooner or later. It took me about five or six years, but I finally got saved. So anyhow, I was in this dire strait. I didn't know what to do. Uh, I cried out to Lucifer for a sign. And I, I you know, because I, I was supposed to have all this great stuff happening to me, and instead my entire life was a shambles. And I said, what's going on here? I cried out for some kind of sign, and within a couple of days... Mormon missionaries knocked at our door. <laughs> and uh, the funny thing about that, now that might seem, well, that's interesting, but what does that have to do with the price of tea in China? Well, I'll tell you. What happens there is that I had been told many years earlier by this grand druid fellow down in Arkansas that if I ever got in really deep spiritual trouble, what I needed to do was join the Mormon church because the Mormon church had been started by witches, for witches, for the express purpose of... Giving, giving people a place, like, a, play, a place for people like me to hide out and appear to be nice, conservative, white-bred, Republican Christians, you know, even though we secretly believed all the same things that witches believed. Now, that might surprise you, but believe it or not, there's plenty of documentary evidence. We go into some of it in our book on the back table called Mormonism's Temple of Doom that, involved, that proves that Joseph Smith was, in fact, a warlock, the founder of the Mormon Church, and most of the early church leaders were deeply involved in sorcery. So anyway, we got into the church. We joined it. They, they loved us. We went through the ranks. I became an elders quorum president. We went to the temple. We had been told by this druid that it would be a profoundly occult experience. And guess what? He was right. It was the high point of our occult life. We, we really thought we were on the right track here because we were part of this huge, powerful, wealthy church and yet we were still serving Lucifer. It was like the best of both worlds. 
In fact, we had a meeting about two days after we were sealed with Elder Faust, who at that time was one of the twelve apostles. Uh, I think he was the low man on a totem pole. That's like the ruling hierarchy of the entire Mormon church internationally. We got in there because we knew certain signs and words and tokens. And uh, he told us, after a lengthy interview, he bore us his solemn testimony that Lucifer was in fact the god of the Mormon temple. So, you know, we knew we were on the right track. Now, what's interesting about all this is I thought I had it made. But God had other ideas. And even though I was in a church where a lot of false doctrine was taught, you know, I, I say this, I say, if God can use a donkey to preach, he can use the Mormon church to get somebody saved. Amen? Understand this. The, this was the first time in my life that I had ever tried to be good. <laughs> Think about it. I mean, if you're, if you're a Satanist, you don't worry about being good. In fact, if you go through a day without breaking one of the Ten Commandments, you think you've had a bad day. But now, because I hope you all understand, Mormons are by and large very nice people. They try, try to live the commandments. They try to be good Christians. Of course, I hope you understand, you can't try to be a Christian. Any more than living in a garage makes you a Cadillac, amen? You just have to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, which Mormons are forbidden to have, that, that, and that's what does it. So I was trying very hard, and I was, I was struggling, and I knew there was something missing. And then the more, you see, again, God can turn things that are even evil into good. They called me to teach a class in the New Testament. And so even though I'd already had a master's degree in theology from the Catholic Church, I never read the New Testament. I never read the Paul, Paul's epistles. And for the first time in my life, I actually sat down and read the King James Bible, that's what the Mormons use, and I found out what was in the book of Romans. I found out what was in the book of Galatians. And I realized that there was no way that Paul could have been a Mormon. Amen? It just didn't work. I realized that I was a sinner and that I needed salvation. And uh, with a lot, it probably took me about six months of really studying and praying and fasting and doing all the things that Mormons are supposed to do when they're faced with a profound spiritual decision. But finally, and believe me, I'm giving you the short version here. Finally, on June 22, 1984, I decided I'd tried everything else, I might as well try this. And I, I took off my magic Mormon underwear because I didn't want any static on the line, amen. I knelt down at the foot of my bed and I prayed the sinner's prayer and I gave my life to Jesus Christ. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So that's, that's the short version. If you want the full-length mini-series version, I'd suggest you check out Lucifer Dethroned out there because it has the whole story. Uh, anyway, I wanted to tell you that because I wanted you to see that I know a lot about what I'm about to speak. I am not an outsider. I was involved in this stuff. I was in it for 16 years, not counting the 20 or so years where I was just simply a devout Catholic. And so this is, this is stuff that's right from the horse's mouth or maybe the devil's mouth, as the case might be. Um, and I want to talk now about what's involved in this conspiracy. Um, it may surprise some of you, maybe not, because I know we have a well-informed bunch here tonight, amen. Uh, it may surprise some of you that if you had to put a name to the conspiracy that's come down to us through the ages, that some call the Illuminati, some other people call it other things, but I think if you boil it down to its purest, simplest form, you would identify it essentially as Freemasonry. Now that might surprise some of you. But understand that Masonry has been around a long, long time. It may not have always been called Freemasonry. But Masons itself brag about the fact that their first Mason was Tubal Cain. Now Tubal Cain, if you know your Bible, was the seventh man from Adam by way of Cain. And he was the guy that invented metalworking. And he is supposedly the first Mason. Now that's pretty far back to start a conspiracy. Then of course you have the flood. After the flood, the Masons say that the first Mason was Nimrod. Now of course we all know who Nimrod was. He's the guy that helped build the Tower of Babel. Now, that's pretty good Masonry, amen? And uh, he United Nations. And um, he had all these great ideas, you know, one world government, all this kind of stuff, new world order. And God had other ideas. And God came down and he cast confusion and, and changed the languages of the people. So they went and scattered abroad on the earth. 
That basically tells us what God thinks about the United Nations. Amen? So anyway, this caused the conspiracy to go underground. And for centuries it existed in various forms. And if, if, you, if you look in the, the books, the literature of Masonry, you will find that Masonry says it is the direct linear descendant from the ancient mystery religions, from the ancient fertility cults. Now what does that mean? That sounds sort of exciting and mysterious and exotic. Well, the ancient fertility cults were cults that revolved around human and animal reproduction. I'm sorry to be blunt, but that's what they mean. It's Baal worship, essentially. If you study the worship of Baal in the Bible, you've got all these false gods like Molech and uh, Baal and Chemosh and some of these others. All of them, their rites involve sexuality. And that's the same thing that masonry is. That's why the god of masonry is the phallus. That's why you have Masonic monuments like the Washington Monument that look like a giant phallic symbol. It's that simple. Um, so this is the conspiracy. And it may have been called many names, like, for example, before the time of Christ, masonry was called the Dionysian Artificers. Uh, later on, it was called the Gnostics. And we'll look at this more in detail in a couple of minutes. But I just want you to realize that even though it was called many things, just like the church, down through the centuries, the church, the true church of Jesus Christ had many different names. But it was the same basic thing. Well, it's the same thing with the devil's church, if you will. Now, people... People get on me about this, you know, and I, I, I get frustrated, I think, because they tell me, well, there's no such thing as a conspiracy. I get this from Christians all the time, and I feel like, you know, knocking on their heads and asking if there's anybody home up there, amen? You know, they say, oh, this is all nonsense. There's no conspiracy. The Bible doesn't say anything about a conspiracy. I mean, excuse me? You know, I mean, for example, just turn to the second psalm. It says in the first verse, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Now that's a conspiracy. Not only that, Jesus Christ himself discussed this very same thing. Um, and, and it's important to understand that the key thing of the, of the conspiracy is that it's done in secret. That's the essence of a conspiracy. Jesus Christ says in John 18, I believe it is, in secret have I done nothing. He taught everything openly. Christianity has no secrets. If you want to find out about what's so great about Christianity, we're delighted to tell you. We don't make you go through a bunch of dumb rituals and stand on your head or wear a blindfold or spit nickels while sitting in lotus position or anything like that. I mean, we're just delighted to share what Jesus Christ has done for us. Our lives are an open book. Our Bible is an open book. You know, there's no secrets. But in the Masons and in all these other occult fraternities, it's all secretive. Now, Jesus himself addressed this. And he addressed it using a powerful metaphor which runs like a, like a web of evil through the entire Bible. And if you go to Matthew chapter 16, you'll find that Jesus says something very important. He says, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now he's talking about leaven. What does that mean? Well, happily, we can look at other parts of the same chapter and Jesus defines it. In the same chapter in verse 12, it says that he was speaking of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So leaven is bad doctrine because we know both the Pharisees and the Sadducees were off into doctrinal error. The Sadducees were a lot like today's liberals. They denied the resurrection. They denied the existence of the supernatural realm. They denied uh, the spirit world and so on. And of course, we all know who the Pharisees were. Paul elaborated on this symbolism further. He said in 1 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8, your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Now that's, that's the key point of the conspiracy. Because if any of you have made bread, how much leaven, which is just yeast, does it take to make bread? Not very much, just a little bit. I mean, if you put too much in, you're going to have something that looks like the monster that devoured Cleveland sitting there on your countertop. Uh, you just take a little bit, and then you work the dough, and you work the dough, and what happens? The leaven disappears. It just sort of blends into the dough, and you can't even tell where it went. But it starts percolating through the entire mass of dough until all of a sudden you've got the whole thing leavened. 
And that's how this works in the church. That's how the conspiracy works in society in general. If you've got one Mason in your congregation, and especially if he's like a deacon or somewhere else in leadership, you're going to end up with um, a kind of one bad apple spoiling the whole barrel routine that's percolating down and you're going to have all sorts of issues within your, within your local body. Similarly, if you have a Mason in your family, his spiritual authority is going to percolate down and leaven the lives of, your, of the wife, of the children, of the grandchildren, of the great-grandchildren down three or four generations and that's a curse that needs to be broken. Leaven like yeast is a living organism which is capable of reproducing itself and that's what happens. You never just have one of these dudes in a church. They always start recruiting because Masons are like homosexuals. They can't reproduce themselves naturally. They can only, yeah, amen, they can only recruit. You know, think of that. That's the way with every cult. See, we are born again. Just like a baby is born out of the womb of its mother, we are born again. No other religion, no other cult can do that. Most especially the Masons. And so they have to recruit. Just like homosexuals are barren, they cannot reproduce themselves naturally, so they have to recruit. That's why you've got the Mormons and the Jehovah Witnesses knocking on your doors, because they're trying to recruit. They're not trying to do evangelism. They're not trying to win souls, because they, if they tried to win a soul, they'd be like a dog that chased a car and caught one. They wouldn't know what to do with it, amen? So this is the problem. They can't reproduce themselves, and so they do it in other ways. Now, the key element here to understand is the fact that Jesus in another chapter talks about the conspiracy of leaven in a very, very specific way. Now, I find this very interesting. I, I know what people are going to say when I talk about this. Oh, the chapter and verse numbers in the Bible aren't inspired and blah, 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 blah. But this is interesting. <laughs> if you go to Matthew chapter 13, verse 33. <laughs> now, think about it. Here you've got the 13th chapter of Matthew, and of course 13 is the number that's associated with witch covens and with the devil and all this kind of thing. And then you've got the number 33, like the 33rd degree Mason. Interesting coincidence. This chapter is the chapter where Jesus does all these fantastic parables about the kingdom. And in there he says, the kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. Now, this is kind of a mysterious passage. And I'll tell you, if you talk to three or four different pastors, you're going to get three or four different exegeses of this passage. And I'm going to try and share with you what mine is, and I trust that it's going to be adequate to the purposes. What we've got here is, first of all, we need to identify the woman. It says a woman did this. Now, who is this woman? Well, some people say that this is the church, but I don't think that's correct. Because, first of all, nowhere in the rest of the Bible do you find a woman identified as a church, symbolically. The church is called the bride, the church is called the lamb's wife, but the church is never called just a woman. So that's one reason. There are other ways in which the woman term is used symbolically and prophetically, and that's what we're doing here tonight. We're looking at prophecy. So prophetically speaking, a woman is used in a positive way as a symbol of Israel. For example, you have um, the woman in, uh, let's see, Isaiah 54, 6, Jeremiah 6, 2, or Revelation 12, 1. These are good women. I have likened Israel to a comely and delicate woman. This is Israel in a righteous state. But there's also Israel in a backslidden state. And this is also symbolized by a woman. For example, in Lamentations 1, 17, Ezekiel 16.30 or Hosea 3.1, where, for example, we have the prostitute Gomer as a symbol of backslidden Israel. Then finally, we have the famous woman, probably the most famous wicked woman in the Bible, which is the, the mystery Babylon in Revelation 17, the woman who is riding the beast. So it doesn't seem to me as though there's any prophetic justification for this woman being, in fact, the church. Now, what about the meal? Well, what is meal? Meal is ground up wheat, okay? What is wheat, symbolically? Well, happily, Jesus tells us that in this very chapter. He says, wheat is the children of the kingdom. See verses 25 through 30 and verse 38 of chapter 13. 
So we are the children of the kingdom. What's this ground up business? Well, think about it. How many of you ever seen actual wheat berries right off the branch, right off the stalk? I mean, they're like, kind of like tiny popcorn. You can't eat them. You can put them in a, in a jar of water and soak them and get them to sprout. Or you can grind them up and make flour, but you just can't eat wheat berries. They're utterly useless. And that's how we are. When we get born again, that we're not much used to Jesus. We have to be ground up and broken and made suitable to the master's service. Amen? That is the key here. So we are talking about the children of the kingdom. Now what does it say? It says that this is divided up into three measures of meal and then the leaven is put in each measure. So we got a division. Now if you th look back at the history of Christendom, basically you've got three major divisions of Christianity. You've got the Roman Catholic Church, the Orthodox churches, and the Protestant church. Pretty clear. Now if you think about it, the Roman Catholic Church has a lot of leaven in it, obviously. I mean, they've got idols, they've got doctrinal problems, they've got all sorts of weirdness going on, purgatory, rosaries, things like that. Uh, unfortunately, the Orthodox Church is not much better. They've got a little improvement, but not much. But then we've got the third one, the Protestant. What is the leaven in the Protestant churches? Well, I think we're going to find very readily that the leaven there is Freemasonry in point of fact. Let's look at this. Down through the years, there's been a fundamental symbol that is p part of the uh, occult. It's part of Freemasonry. And it's from a, a philosophy called the Kabbalah. Now, what, you may ask, is the Kabbalah? Well, it's an occult system of Jewish mysticism and magic that dates back to just before the time of Christ in the intertestamental period, between the time that Malachi wrote his book and the time that John the Baptist began his ministry. Now, the Kabbalah, we are told, is the philosophical core of Freemasonry. It is the ground philosophy behind Freemasonry. And this is its most central and its most important symbol. You will notice here we've got three pillars. The pillar of severity, the pillar of equilibrium, and the pillar of mercy. Now, the pillar of severity in Hebrew is called the Ima pillar. The pillar of mercy is called the Abba pillar. Now, you all probably know what Abba means in Hebrew. It means father. But Ima means mother. So this is the mother pillar and the father pillar. Now, this symbol is very rich in its, in its many, many layers of meaning. I could spend a whole evening just talking about all the different whales and ways in which it, is, um, which it is interpreted. But for now, we're going to look at it chronologically as a, as a, as a kind of a, a game plan for Satan's work down through the centuries. And we see here, for example, the pillar of mercy, the father pillar. What, what did Jesus call the Judaism of his day. He called it the traditions of the fathers. We today, even Bible scholars, in both Judaism and Christianity, will talk about the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's a patriarchal tradition. And so what we have here, this is the father or the patriarchal pillar. It represents apostate Judaism because we all understand that when the Jews ultimately turned their back on the message of Christ in Act 7 when they stoned Stephen, what that ended up with is the light spiritually went out of Israel as a nation and Jews had to start getting saved the same way Gentiles did one at a time. How they need to get saved just like everybody else does by the blood and the cross of Jesus Christ. They need to receive him as Messiah. Now on the other hand, here's the mother pillar. What ecclesiastical institution calls itself the mother? Holy Mother of the Church, the Roman Catholic Church. Isn't that right? So we've got here apostate Catholicism on the other side. Now you've got a, a female and a male and they come together in the center. The pillar of equilibrium is obviously the balancing factor. And this balancing factor is the fact that these um, two other pillars 
bring together an androgynous figure, a figure that is both male and female. And what that is, is basically witchcraft and or Freemasonry. Because both witchcraft and Freemasonry have a bipolar god. They have a god that is male and female. That's why, for example, the Masons have the square and compass. It represents the god and the goddess, the male and female reproductive plumbing. If you want to see this broken down in a more complex way, <laughs> that's pretty complex. This is just since the 1800s. As you can see, Satan has been a busy little boy in the last few years. And uh, he's gotten a lot of stuff, but you'll notice the main trunk of the tree is still Babylonian witchcraft, which is really the same thing as masonry. And if you don't, I don't have time to document that in great detail, but if you go and look at my book, Masonry Beyond the Light, I go into that in a lot of depth. So this is what has happened down through the years, right up to the present day. And I was involved in about three-fourths of these little arrows that you see. And, and I can tell you quite categorically, it is all part of the same tree. Now, I don't expect to have the time to go into all of this, so I'm going to break this down and make it simpler for you. And we're going to talk about the path of Masonry's royal secret down through the centuries. Now, some of you may recall that, that on that certificate I had from the Scottish Rite, I had this wonderful title, Sublime Prince of the Royal Secret. Now, what does that mean? Well, the funny thing is, if you go up to a Mason and you ask a given Mason who's a 32nd degree Mason, what's the Royal Secret? You know what they're going to say? I don't know. <laughs> I even asked them this. I was myself a 32nd degree Mason, and they knew it. So it wasn't like they were trying to keep something from someone who wasn't worthy of this honor to know this. And I, I said, what's the royal secret? And they'd say, I don't have a clue. I don't know. Well, tonight, you're going to find out. You're going to learn something that only one in a hundred Masons knows anything about. And it's a horrible secret. It's a disgusting secret. There's nothing royal about it. But it's why it is kept so carefully guarded within the Masonic hierarchy. Let's look at this. We've talked about some of this already, and so I'm just going to kind of skip over it. We got the Babylonian and Egyptian mystery cults. That's where it all began with Nimrod. Then we have the Kabbalistic religions. I talked about that, the Kabbalah. Then we have the Gnostics. The Gnostics are basically people who believe that you are saved by secret knowledge, to put it simply. Gnosticism it comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge like diagnosis or prognosis. And what they believed is that Christianity, as it is constituted in the Bible, is far too simple. It's a Greek, it's a Greek heresy off of the truth of Christianity. And what it means is, is that you have to go through all sorts of elaborate rituals and details and deal with archons and aeons and logos and all these different things in order to receive salvation. Modern-day Gnostics would be examples, for example, uh, the Mormons, the Masons, a lot of New Agers, all these people believe they're saved by acquiring some sort of arcane, hidden wisdom. Okay, then we've got pre-Islamic sorcery and alchemy. I don't really have time to talk about that, but, but that in turn birthed what is called the assassin cult. Now, some of you may have heard of this. There was a group that came out of Orthodox Islam that was called the Ishmaelians. It was like a splinter group. And these Ishmaelians were a small but powerful heresy. And one of their chief leaders was a sheikh by the name of Hassan e Sabah. And this guy led a group that was called the Hashishim. Excuse me, that's where we get our word assassin, is from the, the Arabic word Hashishim. Now, why were they called Hashishim? Because the word means eaters of hashish. Now, most of you probably have heard of hashish. I hope none of you have tried it, but maybe some of you have. I certainly had my share in my day. Uh, hashish is a powerful form of marijuana, a distillation of its chemically active ingredient, delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, which is called THC for short, and it's what gives marijuana its hallucinogenic properties. So if you take hash, or as it's called colloquially, you get quite a buzz off it. And... Um, what, how this guy worked. He, was the, he is kind of the father of the modern-day conspiracy. He was the father of modern-day espionage. And he was the first programmer, the first mind control operator. 
And this is what he did. If someone wanted to join his group, he knew he needed elite warriors because he had all of Islam arrayed against him. And if any of you have studied Islam, you understand that it has a very interesting approach to soul winning. You come up to someone and you say, you're going to become a Muslim? If you say no, I'm going to cut your head off. <laughs> That's how they worked. That is called jihad, holy war. That's why to this very day you will find certain Islamic factions that will think nothing of blowing themselves and dozens of other people up in what they believe is a service of their God, Allah. And so what happens is they believe if they die in jihad, in holy war, they will go straight to Islamic paradise. Now what's Islamic paradise like? Well, in the days of this uh, Hassan, what you had was the belief, first of all, there were no women in heaven. Sorry, no women. Because women didn't even have souls. Um, that's why even to this very day, women are treated very badly in the Islamic faith. Um, beyond that, when you died, you would go to a place called paradise, where you could do all the stuff you weren't allowed to do as a Muslim. You could eat pork, you could drink wine, and there were these beautiful angels called Uris that looked just like Playboy centerfolds, and they would minister to your every whim throughout eternity. And this is the Islamic paradise. Now, what Hassan would do with one of these recruits, because he needed someone who was just a fanatic, and what he would do is he would bring this person in and feed them a sumptuous meal. And the meal would be laced with copious amounts of hashish. In other words, he'd get the guy really stoned. I mean, we're talking seriously stoned here. And then he would take him into a secret garden in the heart of his castle. And there would be beautiful women, all the pork he could eat, all the wine he could drink. And for three or four hours, the guy would just really enjoy himself. And then he would bring him back when he started coming down off the trip. And he would sit him in the chair and he would say, I have taken you to paradise. I have that power. If you serve me in jihad and die in my service, you will go straight to paradise for all eternity. What do you think the guy said? Where do I sign up? <laughs> you know. And these guys were total fanatics. I mean, they, he was famous for doing things like he'd have 10 of them line up on a wall, he'd snap his fingers and they'd jump in unison a thousand feet to their deaths, grinning all the way because they were dying in his service and they knew they would go straight to paradise. That's mind control, pure and simple. And it didn't stop there. He also invented the idea of the mole, not the little critters that dig up your lawn, but a, an agent, an espionage agent who was hidden deep within the enemy organization. And then when they were needed, they would be called upon to do something. The story is told about a particular person, a caliph. Now a caliph was like a religious leader in medieval Islam who also was a, was a general. And this caliph came up against and tried to attack Hassan's castle. And Hassan sent him a message. And the message said, if you come any closer to me, you will die. And he laughed, the caliph just laughed. He says, I am surrounded by 150 retainers and bodyguards. Some of them have been with me for 15 or 20 years. Most of them are my own relatives. I am invincible. You can't touch me. The next morning he woke up and there were nine assassin daggers buried around his pillow on his head. Needless to say, he retreated. When uh, Hassan e Sabah died, his last word, he never was caught. He never was captured by the Orthodox Muslims. And on his deathbed, his last words were, Nothing is true, everything is permissible. And those have become some of the bywords of the Illuminati that he had such a profound influence on. Okay, moving along. What happened next is the royal secret of masonry passed from the assassins to the Templars. Now the Knights Templar were warrior knights. They were Catholics that took part in the Crusades that you've probably all heard about. They went over to the, to the Holy Land to try and capture the Holy Land back from the Saracens. Now the Saracens were a kind of Muslims. During this conflict, which lasted over a century, 
they began to interface with the um, assassins. They began to share each other's secrets. And so when they lost the Crusades, the Templars went back to Europe, immensely wealthy, immensely powerful, and full of occult knowledge. Now you've got to understand something about the Templars. They, they got very wealthy because they basically provided protection for the pilgrims as they journeyed from Europe to visit the sacred places in the Holy Land. And they got very, very wealthy. Plus there are legends that say that they found Solomon's treasure buried in the ruins of Solomon's temple in Jerusalem and that they were fabulously wealthy. They got so powerful and interestingly enough they became the first international banksters. Everybody tries to blame the Jews for that one but actually the first international banksters were in fact the, the Templars. And um, they got so powerful and so wealthy they threatened the Vatican which was not a wise thing to do. So the Pope got together with the King of France and they conspired to bring down the Templars. In 1307, on October 13th, Friday, they sent out warrants and captured every Knight Templar that they could find, including the Grand Master, whose name was Jacques de Molay. Now, Jacques de Molay was a pretty sinister fellow, and some of you may have heard of the Masonic Order, the de Molays. It's named after Jacques de Molay, believe it or not. And this, uh, this fellow was a pedophile, he enjoyed having sex with young boys. He was also an idolater. He worshipped an idol named Baphomet. And he was a practitioner of black magic. And this is the guy that the Masons idolize as a hero for their young boys. What I tell people is the name of a young boy's order after, Adam, uh, after, after Jacques de Molay is like having a Ted Bundy home for battered women. It's sort of a brutal irony, don't you think? So anyway, when de Molay, this wonderful spiritual giant, died, burned at the stake, and I don't advocate that, please. I mean, I think it was a horrible thing that they did to the Templars. He didn't die the death of a martyr. He wasn't like Stephen and said, you know, Lord, please forgive them. He cursed them. He cursed the Pope, and he cursed the king, and he said within a year they would both be dead, and within a year they both were. Now, whether that's because he was a powerful sorcerer or whether it was because there were assassins who did the job for him, we don't know. So, nobody knows what happened to the treasury of the Templars. It vanished. And the best guesses that we have is that it went up to Scotland where it was hidden along with some remnants because there are vestiges of Templar culture up in the highlands of Scotland that go back to the 1400s. Uh, the next thing is about a hundred years later along came the Rosicrucians. They had the same secret. Some people say that they were just a, a resurfacing of the Knights Templar under a different name. After that, just 34 years later, we have Ignatius Loyola and the Jesuits. Now Ignatius Loyola was a Spanish knight and he got hit in the leg with a cannonball and had to go through a lengthy convalescence. During that time he had some sort of conversion experience and decided this sounds familiar, I know. He wanted to start an order of warrior monks, elite warriors that would protect the Pope and would serve the Catholic Church unwaveringly. He came up with a name for this order. He called it Los Ilumbrados. Now, if any of you speak Spanish, you know that name means the Illuminated Ones. However, the Pope didn't like that name, and so they changed the name to the Society of Jesus. Um, What's interesting, 